Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you. Welcome to day two of the Water for Food International Forum. We have got so much to get done today. I think this assignment will help you do it. Turn to your right and say good morning and give a compliment to the person on your right. Some very effusive compliments going on right now. Excellent. Turn to your left. Give a compliment and say good morning to the person on your left. Excellent. A plus on that assignment. My name is Femi OK. It is my pleasure to be your facilitator today. Uh, we do have translation devices. If you don't speak French, uh, or if you don't speak English and you do speak French, we have translation devices. They're literally just outside the door. Channel one for English, channel two for French. We may well have some uh, participants who will be speaking in French, so you might want to just go and pick one up just in case. Our journey starts today in this auditorium. It ends elsewhere in the World Bank. I will guide you through that journey, but we start it with Nick Brozovic. He's the Director of Policy at the Doherty Water <coughs> for Food Global Institute. Hi there, Nick. Hi. Thank you very much, Femi. Um, I trust everybody is well caffeinated. In, in the next few minutes, I shall uh, uh, try to be as eloquent as Femi, and I shall fail. Uh, there is no question of that. I'd like to spend a few minutes and just frame some of the issues that we talked about yesterday, how that relates to the session this morning, and then how that relates to the material for the rest of the day. When we were um, framing the agenda uh, at the Dorothy Water for Food Global Institute with partners at the World Bank, USDA and USAID, uh, we were particularly interested in a couple of different things. One is how uh, public and private partners can come together to move and scale smallholder irrigation, how technology can help that process, and what are the needs moving forward. So I want to reflect a little bit on what we heard yesterday, and that will be very informative for the session today. Uh, I really liked Tim Pruitt's comments yesterday uh, when they did their uh, customer discovery and said, well, look, what are the three things that are, that are really limiting technology adoption in sub-Saharan Africa? You need peer influence, you need to understand the benefits of irrigation, and you need to have a decent price and finance model. Now, that's actually true everywhere in the world. Uh, one of the things we do at the Water for Food Institute is work across from smallholder irrigation to very large scale, high efficiency irrigation. And those three things are true just about everywhere. And so I think that's certainly one, one parallel we can draw. The other thing, and this is where we're gonna start this morning, is that when you look at those three activities, peer-to-peer uh, -peer networking among farmers, understanding the benefits of irrigation, and pricing of goods or technologies, uh, all of those arguably can be filled by the private sector. All of those things can be done uh, by the private sector. And so the question is then, what is the role of the public sector? What is the role as you scale up irrigation, particularly groundwater fed irrigation, what is the role for the public sector? And one of the important places that we're going to start this morning is if we reach that outcome, if we have millions of hectares of irrigated land that didn't used to be irrigated across sub-Saharan Africa and elsewhere in the world, that creates both challenges and opportunities. We talked a lot yesterday about efficiency, equity, inclusivity. Towards the end of the day, we started talking about sustainability and governance. Uh, and sustainability and governance, those issues of how do you take this resource use, allow it to continue into the future, and how do you deal with managing that system, those are really roles for the public sector. So we're gonna start there this morning. The first session, actually, the speakers don't have expertise in sub-Saharan Africa. They're all experts somewhere else in the world that has dealt with challenges and opportunities 
around water management, and they're here to talk about governance issues. <clears throat> now, they're going to focus on uh, lessons learned from different settings around the world on governance, both developing and developed world settings. They're going to focus also on the role for incentive-based tools to improve governance. Uh, and incentive-based tools are something that come up a lot in policy debates. They are one tool for managing systems. It's important to understand uh, where they can be applied, where they shouldn't be applied. So the speakers will talk some about that. Uh, I have one update to give to the, um, to the audience about the order of speakers, and then I'll pass back to Fermi. So uh, Jasper Fanning, who is a, uh, a water manager from the Upper Republican Natural Resources District in Nebraska, sends his re regrets. Uh, he had a, uh, a death in the family and is unable to attend at the last minute. So his place will be taken by uh, Kate Gibson, uh, who is, uh, uh, helps us manage some of our policy programs at the Water for Food Institute. And she has just helped wrap up a report on uh, groundwater governance and lessons from the West that we just released last week. Uh, so she's very well placed to fill Jasper's place and, and talk about those lessons learned. So with that, thank you very much, and uh, back to Fermi. Tusha Shah, would you walk to the stage? And while you're doing that, let me just ask you in this room, who knows Tusha Shah or heard of his name? Put your hands up. Aha! All right. This is why he is the world's most foremost expert on water management in Southeast Asia. The room knows you. The world knows you. The uh, session is called Collective Action is Making It Happen. But when I ask Tusha, what is your talk? Traditional collection action isn't doing it. Very provocative. Thank you. Good morning, and uh, I'm delighted to be here. I'm uh, grateful to the bank and to Dorothy Institute, Water and Food, for giving me this opportunity. The brief that was given to me was, it went all over. But then I basically understood uh, to mean that uh, that I should look at the experience uh, around the world on uh, farmer-led smallholder irrigation and uh, try and do a review of how uh, this format of irrigation has evolved and uh, what kind of lessons uh, does it offer for, uh, for farmer-led irrigation in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, I think collective action in uh, irrigation context has been very popular in uh, irrigation debates for the past 30, 40 years. Participatory irrigation management, irrigation management transfer, participatory groundwater resources management, all these are buzzwords that are part of the normal discourse in, in water resources. But when we actually talk about the context of collective irrigation, then both in surface water as well as in, in groundwater, there are several um, objectives or there are several issues that are sought to be resolved through collective action. There are resource management issues. There are asset or infrastructure management issues. And there are service irrigation, service management issues. And in all this, there is a role uh, saved for, uh, for collective action by, by farmers. On what basis does this hope that farmers will participate uh, in, in irrigation management or water resources management uh, arise? Now, that comes from the experience that uh, we have in, in in some part of this, uh, of this compact, uh, especially 100, 150 years ago when most of the smallholder irrigation was concentrated in monsoon Asia, there almost all irrigation was involved very high, large amount of collective action. And collective action not only in managing irrigation systems, but also in creating irrigation systems. Irrigation systems in those times used to have some common features. Numbers, number one, almost all of them were based on uh, uh, surface water storage, gravity flow, and open channel water transport. There was hardly any lift involved, except in some Himalayan artesian spring-based systems where water itself came out with some pressure. Another common feature was that they were adaptive in the sense that they were suited to the, uh, to the natural hydrogeology of each, each region and each irrigation system, its design as well as the, the rules for its management basically were grounded in that hydrogeological context. So, for example, in, um, in uh, South of India and in Sri Lanka, we have something like 500,000 uh, irrigation tanks 
uh, each one of which covered between 20 and some even 150 hectares of land. Now, all of these were kind of, they had very similar institutional formats, but the institutional formats for irrigation tanks were very different from the institutional formats for, say, the khanas that you found in Afghanistan or uh, Balochistan in Pakistan or in Iran, uh, which also, again, uh, took uh, water to a number of, number of villages, which in turn were different from the Himalayan irrigation systems or from the Ahar Pine systems in Bihar. So a third feature of this was that all of these, their institutional design, involved a certain number of crafting. And you know it's crafting because within the same class of institutions, there was a lot of similarity, but each class was significantly dif different from the, from the other class. So when people like, um, scholars like Eleanor Ostrom talked about crafting institutions, you know where it came from, that there was a learning process that was involved, and people actually economized on experimentation by learning from the past, uh, from the past experiments in building irrigation systems. And the fourth important characteristic was that if you look at the, the remains of all the systems today, then you find a strong Ostrom impact. It's as if Ostrom went and lectured all of this and they designed their irrigation institutions. So Ostrom's eight design principles, they explain pretty well how many of these uh, traditional irrigation systems, uh, systems work. The interesting thing when I was, uh, I was doing review for this, uh, uh, for this presentation was that in the last 70, 80 years, something has happened. All these structures remain there, the, the, the physical structures remain there, the communities are the same, Ostrom principles are also there, but collective action has more or less collapsed. So in the south of India, for example, I mentioned there are 500,000 irrigation tanks, which were managed 100, 150 years ago through a very complex regimen of rules and, uh, uh, and, and customs. But today, if you try and look for any sign of those, then you will have trouble finding 500 out of those 500,000, which have retained some of, these, some of these practices. Why has this happened? Have the Ostrom principles become invalid suddenly? And, and my, my submission is that, that these this hundreds of thousands of uh, traditional irrigation systems survive in an environment which was defined by five external contingencies, which created pressure within the communities for collective action, and it is that pressure that, uh, that produced these irrigation systems. What are these five contingencies? I think first of them was authority structure. Most of the irrigation systems are actually, um, uh, uh, actually a creation of the ruling classes. Uh, those days, farmers or people as well as state lived off the land. And income from, uh, from the land revenue was the principal source of, uh, of, uh, uh, of government, of state income. So although this appeared to be self-contained, internally driven irrigation systems, there was a strong imprint of, uh, of the authority of the state. So when the Sri Lankan king say that anybody who cuts an irrigation channel will have his hand chopped off, it basically is a signal that uh, there was a state authority behind the rules for, uh, for collective management that, that were formulated and enforced at the community level. The second important contingency was uh, the lack of exit path. Those were the times when uh, being in a rain-fed farm, uh, rain farming context was much inferior in terms of livelihood than being as part of a, of, a, of, a, uh, of a collectively managed irrigation system. And therefore, there was an incentive for a farmer in a collective irrigation system to actually fall to comply with the, with the rules and norms because the, the price of not doing that was too high. Third was centrality of irrigation system. Uh, in, in, an area, in, an, in an age when the, that food, family food subsistence was the most important criterion that drove farmers' behavior, there being an irrigation system which ensured that uh, you had uh, food security that basically was good enough to ensure the loyalty and the allegiance of, of the members. The fourth was the agrarian structure. Almost all irrigation systems in Monsoon Asia until 1940 or 1950 used to grow only one crop, rice. And the rice that was grown was bred for a certain irrigation, irrigation regimen. Now, if everybody in the, in the irrigation system grows only rice, then managing that irrigation system becomes ever so much easier because water distribution, irrigation scheduling, all, all of that is the same. If those farmers had been growing 50 different crops as they're doing now, then managing an irrigation system for a certain level of service 
would have become impossible. And the fifth was a very high level of social capital. The villages in, in monsoon Asia was as if in a time warp. So they were insular, and there was a very high buildup of social capital, which also ensured. So it is these five external contingencies which created pressure and demand for collective action within, within communities. In the past 70, 80 years, one thing that happened is that one after the other, all these contingencies have got eroded. Authority structures, the traditional authority structures have disappeared. And today, actually, there is a vacuum in the sense that most states have become welfare states, and they no longer depend on agriculture for the main, as to be the main source of state, of state income. Uh, and this has actually hurt communal irrigation systems, primarily because the state has stopped uh, performing its main role, which is that of managing the main system, especially in multi-village irrigation systems. Uh, in terms of alternative to collective action, there are two. Number one, urbanization has opened up new off-farm livelihoods. There is exodus of young people from, from farming almost everywhere, and this has weakened those links. Other major disruptor has been the rise of pump irrigation. Pumps and pipes in command areas have done untold damage to the traditional modes of collective action in many of these irrigation systems. Agrarian structure has also morphed in ways that doesn't support collective action irrigation system. Very high level of tenancy, fragmentation and subdivision of land holdings. Uh, all these have, and of course, the range of new crops that have come up. And centrality. Uh, ev almost everywhere, smallholders depend on pump irrigation for high value crops. When it comes to canal irrigation or uh, surface irrigation, they, they use it only for wheat, rice, and subsistence crops. But when it comes to generating cash, they always turn to private, uh, private lift irrigation. So it's basically the erosion of all this, which has changed the, uh, the, the essence of, uh, of these communal irrigation systems. So for the past 50 years, we have spent billions of dollars invested in rehabilitating and modernizing these irrigation systems, where the diagnosis is that what's wrong with the systems is uh, poor infrastructure. We have uh, the Secretary of Agriculture from government of Tamil Nadu here. In the last 50 years, Tamil Nadu has taken at least five loans from World Bank and the ADB to rehabilitate its irrigation tanks. The result, build, neglect, rebuild. You build, rebuild an irrigation tank, and five or six years later, later, it's again ready for another round of rehabilitation, simply because the collective action structures that used to work in the past, they no longer do today. So, <clears throat> Sorry, I've just been running a mock with my presentation. So there was a time when, when collective action used to work primarily as mutual cooperation by mutual coercion, with some coerced more than others. But the basis for this has, has collapsed because all these contingencies have, uh, have changed in ways that doesn't support uh, participatory management by, uh, by farmers. And in South Asia, and I think most of the rehabilitation modernization, modernization programs pay very little attention. It is impossible to recreate those uh, contingencies under which collective action worked. But if we understood how this contingency drove the internal dynamic of village communities, then, it, when, then we might try creating surrogates of those. For example, the interface between the village community and the main system is extremely crucial on whether farmers are able to forge collective action for water management below the outlet. But very few reha rehabilitation programs actually focus on that. But things that you could probably do to improve the chances of collective action is just improve the main system management, help the farmers in the command area to move from basic subsistence crops to higher value uh, market crops, try and restrict or at least socialize private pump irrigation in, in canal commands, and invest in building social capital in the community, which is specific to, uh, to the management of, management of irrigation. But if you really look at what goes off in the name of uh, rehabilitation modernization, basically PIM, or participatory irrigation management and irrigation management transfer, have basically meant dumping dilapidated irrigation systems on unsuspecting farmers. And it's therefore not surprising that collective action has really, really not, uh, not worked. And this is how the transition between production irrigation that used to be the rule until 50, 60 years ago, to social irrigation has occurred in South Asia. 
this map shows the rise of uh, private irrigation or farm led private irrigation in south asia each of these dots represents 5000 irrigation wells so there are some like 30 million irrigation wells all invested with uh, built with private capital invested by farmers this 30 million wells have added three times more irrigation than government investments added in past 150 years in in the region and why is why is farmer investing so much in simply because farmers who are earning, who are depending on private irrigation, they generated way more uh, cash income than farmers who are dependent on surface irrigation. In EME, in my institute, where, uh, where we have been having this debate uh, for the past 15, 20 years, there is a section who used to think that this may have happened in India, in Pakistan, in China, in elsewhere in Asia, but this could never happen in sub-Saharan Africa, because it's a different region, the society is different, the social structure is different, geography is different, dem demography is different. And we, some of us used to keep asking, but smallholder everywhere is aspiration. Everybody wants more income. So if smallholder in, uh, in Asia is able to make more money by developing pump irrigation, why won't a smallholder in South Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa would want to do that? But there was no answer to that until in 2011 or 12, when we got a small U USAID grant to do a study of uh, irrigators in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. So we, we found uh, 1,600 farmers in, in uh, nine countries. And this is the key result of that study. We found that there is hardly any difference between rain-fed farmers and gravity flow irrigators in sub-Saharan Africa, or in our sample in sub-Saharan Africa. But the moment you went to uh, move to manual lift and motor pump irrigation, in terms of net income generated per, uh, per uh, family worker in agriculture, you had a three-time increase. So you can, we can now understand why, uh, why smallholders is turning to motor pump irrigation in, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, because per, per worker, you're able to generate thousand, more than $1,000 a year, whereas from all other irrigation sources, you're generating just about one-third. So basic, the basically, what the, the drive, uh, the factors that are driving smallholder irrigation, private irrigation in Asia, have also begun to work in pretty much the same way in Sub-Saharan Africa, and there seems no way anybody can stop uh, this from happening. So motor pump irrigation is unleashing the entrepreneurial energies of the, sub, of the smallholder in Sub-Saharan Africa. One important finding was that almost all women farmers that we, we surveyed all use manual irrigation. And all motor pump irrigators were men. And that's, I think, one major challenge in, uh, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Now, I think forging collective action in natural resource management is way more difficult than irrigation management transfer, because exclusion uh, is much more difficult when you're talking about the groundwater, which nobody can see and so forth. So there is a lot that has been done. But in Asia, much of it hasn't worked. And what has really worked in countries like India is I think there is now greater uh, uh, enthusiasm among farmers for water harvesting, groundwater recharge, and also uh, some amount of rationing of electricity supply to groundwater users has played some role. I think a major disruptive force is kind of there's a new kid on the block, which is the rise of the solar pumps. And uh, in 2015, uh, in Delhi, I was talking to a bunch of uh, managers of electricity companies, and I was basically telling them that uh, we have become our, India has become a a groundwater basket case, and the electricity industry is mostly responsible. And now that the way they are promoting solar pumps, things are going to get only, only worse, because in 2012, India had only 5,000 solar pumps. Today, India is already close to 200,000, and the rate with, at which solar pumps are increasing is going to uh, enormously increase the pressure on groundwater resource. And I think the same thing is going to happen in uh, sub-Saharan Africa as well. So we were discussing solutions, and I asked um, them that one way you can turn this into an opportunity is by, by electricity companies treating farmers as, as independent power producers and treat them at par with utility-scale power generators. And the Secretary of Power in Gujarat uh, asked me, how do you do that? How do you buy five, 10 units of power from farmers every, every, uh, every day? So the one answer that came out of the discussion was that if solar pump owners in a, in a village were formed into a microgrid owned by a cooperative, then maybe the company could buy power from the single cooperative. So then I, we started going to the villages and asking farmers, would you be willing to surrender your subsidized grid electricity to get a solar pump from which you can sell your surplus, surplus power to the grid? And we found that one village agreed 
And there are 15 farmers whose pumps were solarized and we formed them into a microgrid. And they have been selling power for the past two years, nearly 23 or 24 months. And this chart shows the result. The blue part of each bar shows monthly solar power generation by the entire group used for irrigation, irrigating their own fields, and for selling water to, to the neighbors. And the orange part of the bar shows the power that they evacuated and sold to the grid. Now the question is that if, this, if they didn't have this option of evacuating this power to the grid for a price, what would they have used this power for? My own assessment is that their mind would have worked in, in over, overdrive. They would have found ways to grow new crops and irrigate new crops. New crops. So one of the solutions in which you can convert solar pumps into an opportunity rather than a threat is by treating farmers as people who can generate, who can grow energy as a remunerative crop, uh, provided they have an opportunity to sell surplus power to the, to, the, to the grid. So I think these are the new forms of collective action that we need to, uh, need to uh, figure out and design for the new times. Thank you very much. One moment. We're going to be the play on music for Chris Hartley and his panel. Do panel, do come up here. Chris, bring your panel up here. Uh, Tushar asked me something. I was asking people yesterday, what was your connection to agriculture? Tell us an epic story, something that actually helps us understand why you're even here, why you're doing what you're doing. Uh, panel, do come on. Do come on. This is, do you, you can come on and, and sit down while we're doing this. Um, what was your story? So my, my story was that the times have changed and you need new forms of collective action for new times. That's your story? Yeah. Do you know what he just did? He just did an extension of his talk. <laughs> <laughs> Very sneaky. Thank you so much, Thank Tushar you. Shah. Tushar Shah is a senior fellow at the International Water Management Institute. So in this panel, you will have a chance to also talk to the panelists, to talk to the speakers. If you're new with us, if you're just joining us today, on the right-hand side of the microphone there, you will see what looks like a mouth speaking. If you push that, the microphone will go red, and then you can be part of the conversation as well. Chris Hartley is from USDA. Chris Hartley, this is your panel. Looking forward to it. Thank you very much, and thank all of you for being here as well. As Nick mentioned earlier, what we've done really is we've collected some experts for you in collective, not so much collective action, but more in um, opportunities for um, providing incentives for collective action within water management. And when we did this, we realized we didn't really have anyone that had been working in Africa extensively. So what we've done instead is we've taken the experts and we've taken some folks who have a lot of experience working in water in Africa, and we're going to ask them to say whether or not these experts and their perspectives hold water or not in Africa. So on our panel today, we have uh, Mr. Tushar Shah, who you've been introduced to, uh, Mr. Dustin Garrick, the co-director of the water program at the Smith School of Enterprise and Environment at the University of Oxford, uh, Ms. Kate Gibson, a program coordinator from the Robert B. Darty Water for Food Global Institute, Ellen Hannock from the Public Policy Institute of California, and uh, Jose Luis Taylor, the director of Agro Negocios at Grupo Modelo Imbev. So what we've done really is we've got folks from academia, from the private sector, and then we've got these two folks on the end down there. Um, Bansi Mahdi, the director of the Water Research and Rural Resources Center from Jomo Kenyatta University in Agriculture and Technology, and Fred Kitso, a senior scientist at the International Center for Tropical Agriculture. And really what I want them to do is to tell you what it is that they heard. And then I want all of you to tell all of us what it is that we can do to help improve incentive-based management of agriculture. So I'm gonna get off of here and let uh, Dustin speak from where he is. Good morning, everyone. Should have some slides um, to, uh, to share, and uh, I wanted to start while these are, are coming up by thanking the organizers and convening us to tackle an important challenge. And uh, I also acknowledge that if I had known that I would be following Tushar Shah in my comments, I would have had to, to rethink whether to agree. That was a fantastic um, presentation and uh, outlined some important challenges for us all. Uh, I'd like to, to pick up on some of those themes around um, the need to rethink collective action in the context of growing urbanization. And uh, as we discussed over yesterday and today, the need to scale up small scale and other forms of irrigation, 
this will come into collision with the mega trends that we heard about many times yesterday around rapid urbanization and climate change. And I want to convey as a main message that this potential competition between cities and agriculture over water could be transformed into opportunities for benefit sharing and regional development by using a blend of incentives, technology, and governance. I'm gonna draw from some of the work that I've been doing on these themes, but uh, as the moderators and, and at Nick uh, presented at the outset, I don't have the experience in Africa, but have worked on these issues in the context of Mexico, the US, and Australia. And I wanna start by highlighting the challenge, which is familiar to many of us. Um, recent results in nature sustainability highlight the growing urbanization in the 21st century and the potential for escalating deficits in uh, water supplies in cities and the growing potential for competition between cities and agriculture over water. And these um, results lead to the conclusion that there will be increasing interdependence between cities and agriculture and increasing potential for winners and losers as uh, growing cities uh, require water from interbasin transfers and other sources. And this is intensified in the context of climate change and the impacts of droughts, as you um, have um, all been encountering with the situation in Cape Town, we see one example of a wider trend that when droughts hit, the impacts are disproportionately felt by farmers and irrigation as uh, cities are often treated as the first uh, priority. And let me emphasize in our current thinking about the nature of this challenge that there are some significant blind spots that we're missing, including the types of urbanization which will be relevant to some of our discussions today in rapidly growing towns and cities uh, which have not historically had the infrastructure and development um, where the cities under threat are currently located. And so it's in that context that there's potential for rethinking and framing the collective challenges across the interface or the divide between cities and agriculture and exploring the development of incentives that can move beyond a zero sum game where these growing cities achieve water security at the expense of agriculture and at the expense of potential uh, small scale and other forms of irrigation agriculture. This is well illustrated in the case of Monterrey, Mexico, rapidly growing city in northern Mexico. Its population went from 300,000 in 1950 to almost 3 million in 1990. And on this urbanization trend, you see the spatial expansion of the city on the left leading in tandem to the transfers and importation of water um, from surrounding basins and regions which had temporary impacts on downstream agriculture and led to significant protests and resistance from uh, irrigation districts which stood to lose from these new projects and the importation of water into the city of Monterey. But over the negotiations around this project, there was the shift from and transferring the water to the city exclusively to looking at it from a perspective of benefit sharing and regional cooperation, developing a portfolio of compensation and incentives which compensated uh, irrigators for irrigation efficiency improvements and subsidized, provided a positive subsidy for irrigation modernization and complemented that with alternative water supplies such as water reuse and monetary payments that could be used at the farm level uh, to increase the competitiveness and productivity of farm enterprises. 25 years on from this project, which was started in 1993, productivity levels have been maintained in the irrigation region and uh, now the water supplied from this project provides 20% of the water for the city of Monterey. This is an example where a regional perspective has enabled collective action across the urban rural divide and provided opportunities. And there are many different tools which are provided and can offer incentives for both discouraging waste, creating a price signal opportunity cost for water and agriculture, as well as encouraging efficiency by providing carefully targeted and uh, technically informed irrigation modernization opportunities. And these uh, examples are happening across the world and generating some lessons um, where it's possible to share uh, the benefits associated uh, with uh, the urbanization across the urban world divide and increase the competitiveness of, of irrigation agriculture. Uh, 
in terms of general lessons or principles, it's going to be hard to transfer across context. Yet one of the things we really heard um, importantly yesterday is how context matters. And as Tushar's presentation emphasizes, we may be able to identify principles, but these need constant updating and refinement based on new experiences and challenges. S some work that we've done over the last year has um, developed a global perspective reviewing experiences with rural urban water sharing and emphasized how the uh, global experience points to some building blocks that may be useful in our discussions today. In the map, uh, what you see here is the World Resource Institute baseline water stress index. And if you strain your eyes um, and um, identify the black dots, you'll see over 40 examples of rural urban uh, water sharing and uh, a set of four of these examples which are highlighted uh, where we've done some in-depth analysis of uh, water sharing arrangements uh, in Monterey, Sao Paulo, Mocapane, a rapidly growing town in uh, South Africa and uh, Melbourne. And uh, the potential for collective action and benefit sharing depended on a systems perspective in defining the collective action challenge across an urban-rural divide. Um, second, uh, water, under, water accounting underpins incentives and uh, accounting both the monetary and water uh, flows um, between cities and agriculture and within those boundaries to look at the potential for efficiency improvements and the potential for sharing benefits. And then uh, lesson three was the importance of um, designing and crafting incentives that could and maximize um, the gains from these types of water sharing arrangements, in particular moving from a compensation perspective to a benefit sharing perspective for the region, not only the individuals directly impacted. Um, that perspective has the potential to develop a regional infrastructure, accounting basis, and the governance um, to get to scale. Which leads to the last um, lesson, which is the importance of embedding uh, the water sharing arrangements in sound governance and thinking about the, the enabling environment for the type of collective action um, that is needed. Now we have uh, translation devices for English and French, but we don't have one for uh, working across the rural urban divide. There are often different languages, different districts, um, different perspectives, and um, there's a big gap between discussions of basin governance and what's happening at the irrigation district or at the uh, municipal utility level, that mesoscale um, uh, platform for, for governance is needed. Um, the, f the final points that I mentioned is the paradox of incentives. When we think of incentives, we think of uh, markets, we think of decentralized decision making, but the paradox is that scaling up collective action and developing incentives that can achieve outcomes at scale hinges on coordination. Um, this is uh, illustrated by the often cited experience in Australia. You see results here from um, a, a rare uh, long-term set of surveys of irrigators in southern Australia where the more active uh, water markets are occurring. And what you're seeing is that um, over the period from the early 1990s um, to uh, 2016, you've had a, uh, activity and participation in the market by irrigators increased up to 80% of irrigators in um, the survey sample. What's not depicted here, however, has been the importance of uh, water rights and, uh, and, and enabling incentives through strengthening of water rights and investment in the basin accounting and governance that underpins growth and trade and ensures that that trade um, minimizes the unintended consequences. And what we're seeing um, that even in these cases in Australia, there's a constant need for vigilance and strengthening um, accounting and governance as um, challenges with enforcement can arise. So in sum, um, I have much more to learn than to share, but I think what I've, I've tried to do is highlight some issues that can frame our um, discussion around um, the need to shift from urbanization as a threat to also an opportunity um, because of um, the competition between cities and agriculture coming with growing interdependence um, and bringing those perspectives into our analysis of hotspots and opportunities. Um, and second, the incentives can move us past a zero-sum game by moving toward a, sharing, a benefit sharing perspective, but this hinges on uh, the tripod of infrastructure, accounting, and governance. And finally, uh, incentive-based approaches and scaling up incentive-based approaches will require coordination with crowding without crowding out. So building capacities, and we heard yesterday from the congressman about this in, in emphasis on subsidiarity as a principle and really empowering um, uh, farmers and, and others who are close to the problems to solve them, and I think that's exactly what is needed. And sometimes complementary institutions will be needed uh, to stimulate these local initiatives or to help build capacity and get past the chicken or the egg problem that may arise. 
so thank you for uh, the opportunity and looking forward to the discussion. All right, good morning. I'll wait for them to pull up my slides here. So someone mentioned yesterday that Sub-Saharan Africa might be a little bit behind, a little bit late to the table in terms of irrigation. But that's not necessarily a bad thing because there's opportunity to learn from the experiences of those who've been managing groundwater, irrigating for a long time, because we've messed up along the way. So there's no, no point in repeating our failures. So today I'll be talking about the experience of Nebraska in managing groundwater for agricultural production. Nebraska has been proactively managing groundwater for over 40 years, and we've learned a lot along the way. Um, a few speakers yesterday mentioned that Nebraska is the state with the most irrigated area of any state in the United States. We have 3.3 million irrigated hectares. It's a lot of land, and we have a lot of high productivity maize and soybean. And that depends on our ability to irrigate. So under Nebraska, we have the High Plains Aquifer, which is a massive groundwater system. And to our south, areas of the aquifer have experienced significant declines, up to 30 meters in some areas. Now, Nebraska has been largely buffered from this due to a couple of reasons, but mostly because we have this phenomenal system of local management of our groundwater uh, system. So here on this map, we show Nebraska's natural resources districts. These are 23 districts that are responsible for managing groundwater in Nebraska. They're based on watershed boundaries, and what's really neat about them is that they are governed by locally elected boards that are mostly made up of farmers. So you have farmers on these boards making decisions for themselves and their neighbors. So I'll talk about a few lessons that I think we can learn from Nebraska. The first being building trust. So it's essential to have trust in your system. If you're asking people to manage groundwater for the long term, that often means you're asking them to change the way that they're doing what they do in ways that have financial impacts on them, and it impacts their livelihood. So people have to be bought in. The farmers need to agree with how the system is being managed. So these natural resources districts accomplish that because farmers, as I mentioned, are on the boards. So they are invested, they are key decision makers in the process. One other way that they build trust is that in addition to managing groundwater, these districts manage other resources. They provide cost sharing for new technologies. They manage uh, recreational sites. So they provide these other services that are viewed very positively. So when it comes time to managing groundwater that sometimes is uh, not super exciting, not everybody really wants to be told how much water they can use, there's that history of trust that's been built up. The second lesson is the need for data. This is probably pretty obvious to most of us that data is a key asset in decision making. But data collection is costly, time intensive, and often controversial. If you've spent all these years building trust with farmers, building trust in the community, you don't want to jeopardize that by requesting data that people don't want to share. So it's important when you're looking at collecting data, what is the essential data that you need? The third lesson is using a portfolio of approaches. This is something we'll talk about more today. It's not just one tool that will accomplish managing groundwater long term sustainably. It's a portfolio of approaches. It's maybe having meters, but having an educational system, a system for permitting. All of these things work together using a mix of incentive-based, non-incentive-based tools. The fourth is assuring performance. In Nebraska, the current challenge is really how do we continue to manage groundwater for the long term while ensuring that farmers have productive livelihoods? So to do that in Nebraska, that largely looks like, in some areas, limiting how much groundwater can be used. If you tell someone that you can only use 300 millimeters, but then you don't follow up and don't ensure that people are only using that amount, there's incentive to use more, right? So Nebraska has been very strict in following up and managing those regulations. One of our districts that uh, Mr. Fanning was supposed to be here representing, they have four staff people who monitor meters in the district to ensure that people are using the right amount of water. And when they find that it might be their neighbor, you know, I'm on the board and I discover that my neighbor is cheating and using more water than they should be, they still um, value that um, 
paying attention and following regulations. So there was a gentleman who was found to be bypassing the meter. He was supposed to be using 300 millimeters, and he was using far more than that. The district permanently removed the right to irrigate. That's a, that set a precedent that we in the community are in this together. We all need to be on board. And there was support from the other farmers. They're trying, trying their best because they want that resource to be available for further generations. And the last key lesson is adequate funding. Not news to any of us, but sometimes I think we take for granted just how much money is required to build up these lessons, to build trust, have educational programs, infrastructure improvements. In Nebraska, we have a state of about 2 million people. These 23 districts have a combined annual budget of $250 million. It's a lot of money. And they collect that money because they have authority to collect taxes, property taxes, irrigation taxes taxes. And that gives them a lot of resources to carry out programs that have been highly successful in reducing groundwater declines to ensure that farmers have that resource for the long term. I'll end with this quote from a farmer in Nebraska. Uh, when talking about managing his land, managing his water, he said, it's not a quick reward, it's a tomorrow reward. It comes down to doing what's right. So we have a lot of farmers who are bought in. They believe in this system. They want to manage the resource. But also from the district perspectives, they have to do what's right by the farmers also. It's a two-way street, maintaining that resource and ensuring that farmers have that resource to ensure their livelihoods. So thank you. Good morning. Um, so I'm going to... I'm Ellen Hannock, and I'm going to talk to you a bit about some experiences in California with managing surface water trading, which is a, one of the incentive-based ways to manage scarcity, uh, water scarcity. And, and another is talking a little bit about a, an experiment that California has re recently started in managing groundwater. Um, so, and we're looking to places like Nebraska to, <laughs> to, to figure out what to do. So, first I'll just give you a little bit of background on, on the idea of trading, which, which some of the, the speakers have already mentioned as a, as a, a possible way of, of providing incentives for, for collective action. The idea of trading, sometimes called marketing, sometimes exchanging, um, is to, to trade water on a temporary basis, on a long-term contractual basis, or sometimes permanently trading water rights or contracts to use water. And why folks are interested in this is something, I'm an economist by training, economists love this idea, um, but it, it's actually good even though economists say it's good, so uh, it, can be, it can be useful, um, is that if you've got a limited amount of water um, and, and Increasing the supply can be either difficult or very expensive, or in some cases, it's just really not possible. You need to think about as um, conditions evolve, uh, both in the in the short term, if you have droughts, um, how do you make sure that the places that wh where the shortages are going to be most costly to the society and the economy get some water? Um, you know, you want human access to water for, for survival to be probably a, a predominant thing, which is why it's important to get water to a place like Cape Town when, when they really are running out. Um, but you also, in, in agriculture, you can think about that as uh, places where, where the crops have tree crops, you might really want to keep those trees alive, and it could be less costly for the economy as a whole to reduce the, the, the annual crops during that drought time. It allows for also helping to accommodate shifts in demand over the long term, and that can be across uh, crops and regions within agriculture, but also as the example that Dustin talked about of moving some water to urbanizing areas um, over time. And then it can, uh, all of these are sort of often intensified with the uh, changing climate, so it can help you to adapt to that. And so California has, has been thinking about water markets actively for all of these reasons really since the, since the early 90s. And as we think about this, um, and this is, I would say, true in the, in the Western US more generally, you know, as, as Dustin mentioned, also the example of Australia, you have to think about what kind of trading is possible given some requirements and constraints. One of them is you need infrastructure 
to be able to move the water around. So you, if you're completely unconnected from one place to, from point A to B, it's gonna be very hard to, to trade that water. Um, and sometimes that means it can justify building some new connect connections and conveyance in order to be able to move the water. Um, but then a key thing, and this is why markets are often held up and don't happen, is you have to think about who might be harmed by the trade because it's not just like moving some boxes of a good from one place to another. That water flows through uh, river systems and, and it has other users involved. And so you want to make sure that you're not causing injury to other folks that are depending on that water. And in, in the Western US, there's a lot of concern not only about other agricultural and urban users, but also about the environment. And then there's a concern often in the source regions about what happens if we sell our water, even if the farmers who sell make some money and are, uh, are made whole by it, what about all the other people that depend on, on that? And so thinking about mitigation, and that sort of gets to some of these ideas about how do you creatively think about compensation um, in ways that deal with the community and not just the, not just the, the people who are selling the water. Now, in California, a lot of those issues, those protection issues, are, are, are things that are a work in progress. But I would say we have some interesting experiments with large-scale trades between cities and farms that set up special funds to try to do uh, support local economic development. And that's, that's been something that has helped to, to make it more palatable. And I think there's some lessons to learn from that. I will say that we do have an extensive amount of infrastructure. Um, so that was built not for reasons of trading, but just to move water from wet places to dry places. That map with all those squiggles, that shows you a lot of uh, man-made conveyance, as well as there are a few rivers in there too. And so we are able to move water around quite a bit. So we're known for some of these quite long distance transfers of, of surface water. Um, and also some, you know, a lot of local ones, and that, that's made possible through these sur surface water irrigation districts that are, are pretty well organized and, and, and pretty sophisticated. Um, but now we are entering a new world, and that is the world of sustainably managing our groundwater in our rural areas. We've had for a long time, and Eleanor Ostrom actually did some, uh, some of her, t her labs did some studies of Southern California groundwater management um, back, you know, some decades ago there, the cities were pumping groundwater so rapidly that they were causing problems that they realized they had to solve. And so they adapt, adopted local mechanisms for managing those groundwater basins. But that has not uh, really, had not really happened in our agricultural areas. And we've got, we, we're almost as many acre, hectares as, as Nebraska in irrigation. I think we're like 3.6 million hectares or something like that. And our irrigation depends, it's, it's almost entirely depending on irrigation because we don't have uh, precipitation in our, in our summer months. So there's a lot of irrigation um, for agriculture and it's uh, probably, you know, varies between, uh, groundwater is between a third and two thirds depending on if it's a wet year or a dry year. Um, so what was, we had a very bad drought in 2014, in the, in the early, earlier part of this decade, and in 2014, at the height of the drought, the legislature finally made us the last U.S. state to have a groundwater law requiring groundwater management. So this is the authority idea that Tushar was talking about of the state saying, you've got to do it. Um, it created a lot of panic in rural areas, but um, they've, they've been given some time to kind of get organized. So there's this now with this grand experiment with the development of sus local sustainability agencies, groundwater, GSAs we call them, groundwater sustainability agencies. We have many more than in Nebraska, even though I'm not sure the area of irrigation is that much bigger. So people were allowed to organize and they could have multiple of these within their basins. Um, and that's probably gonna shake down and, and, and there will probably be some agglomeration over time. But, th but these folks are now organized and developing plans and they're going to have to start implementing plans by 2020 for the most critically overdrafted areas and by 2022 for, for the others. They're gonna have to look at supply issues you know, both avoiding overdraft, uh, watching about groundwater levels, land sinking. They're gonna have to also look at water quality implications and also the links between groundwater and surface water and, and ecosystems. So it's a tall order. And the, the area where I just wanna highlight, cause I think it's relevant, especially for places like 
like India and, and some others in the, in the world where groundwater pumping has really become a way to uh, uh, enable irrigation um, in, in places that don't have elaborate surface irrigation or that don't, don't use that where it's not as, not as suitable anymore. These, uh, the, the region that's highlighted in the, in the black lines there, that's the San Joaquin Valley, which is uh, about half of all of, our all of our agriculture is produced there. And it's in bright orange mostly because it's a critically overdrafted area. They're probably using about 15% more water on average than, than is replenished every year um, by the groundwater. And so these folks are now in the position of knowing that they have to get into balance by 2040. And what they're looking at is how do we do this? Are there ways to add some more water? Um, and they're, they're looking for all the options, but probably the most, pos most positive and, and uh, cost-effective way to do this is by recharging more into the groundwater basin, really thinking about cooperative management of surface water and groundwater so you get more water in the ground when it's available. And that is really opening up the possibilities of partnership and cooperation between surface irrigators and groundwater users looking for where's the best land to recharge, how do you give incentives and credit to people, either in money or maybe in water, you know, if they let that happen on their land. A lot of very interesting experiments with that. And then the other piece that they're looking at is very localized farmer-to-farmer -farmer trading for groundwater management. And the idea is in a basin, you'll have a budget. And I, this is, I think, in some parts of Nebraska, folks do this as well. You've got your budget but not all land is of the same value, so maybe it makes sense to do some trading and leave some of the land idle some of the time in order to get, you get some money for, th for that for if you don't use water on your land and then somebody else can use a bit more water. Um, and, and that is what folks are looking at now. Um, who was it who mentioned accounting? I think both, both of you did, and that is really key for this, and so this is what folks are now in the process of developing. And so stay tuned and, and come help us if you have ideas on, on how to make that work. Thank you. Okay, good morning and thank you for the World Bank for inviting me. Uh, I'm Jose Luis Taylor. I'm the Director of Sustainability and Agro-Development in AB, uh, AB InBev. And let me explain you who is InBev because there's always time for a beer, right? Uh, we are the largest brewing company in the world. Uh, we have a revenue of 55, 55 billion, more than 60 years of history. We have the oldest brand in the whole story. If you see Stella Artois, it is, it is from 1366. So it's the oldest brand of the history. And you can see we have global brands as Corona, Budweiser's, and Stella. We operate in different countries, 50 countries, and we sell in 150 markets, okay? Uh, our board has launched our new sustainability goals. And if you can see here, smart agriculture and water are, the, are key for us. Why? Because we are uh, buying 6 million tons of barley, and if we don't have barley in the future, we are going, not going to ha have beer, and we are not going to have fun, okay? So, as you can see, this is the importance of, uh, of, of our agro-development footprint. Uh, we have a lot of research. We have the largest barley research in Denver, Colorado. Uh, we, are, we, we, are going, we are investing more than $10 million on research. Uh, we have 75 ag own agronomists, and we are supporting more than 5,000 uh, farmers. So, uh, I'm going to share it with you that it's possible to have a public-private project, and, uh, and it's possible. Sometimes it's really difficult. It's more, you, you fight more internally than externally sometimes, but it's possible. Uh, we develop a project here. If you see the orange triangle, it, it is the state of Zacatecas. It's in the north of the country. It's where the largest brewery in the world is. We are producing 24 million hectoliters a year, uh, but it's in the water stress area ever, not in Mexico. So the numbers that you see on the right uh, uh, is really similar to the numbers that uh, were presented yesterday. Uh, only 70% of, well, all the 70% of the sweet water is used in agriculture. 
but uh, from the, all the irrigation surface that we have in the country, only 5% is irrigation, is technified. So the opportunity is big, no? Um, but a lot of, 45% uh, of, of the water is wasted, and, uh, and there's poor, it's a poor people there, no? So that's why we, we try to develop something, because um, as, as, is, as we have the, the largest brewery there, if we, don't, if we don't do something, we are not going to survive in the future. So uh, we, we discussed it yesterday. Uh, the, the main challenges here is drought, you know, um, the growing water demand and population is, is, a, is, a, is a challenge. Uh, water is contaminated and poor quality. There's no infrastructure. Uh, there are bad irrigation practices. And the main problem here, and the problem that I, I f we are facing is that the water in Mexico is really cheap. <coughs> Nobody value it, and so they are wasting a lot. So this is the project. It's, it was a drip irrigation project. Uh, we tried to, to, to improve uh, and involve uh, the farmers that are located close to our main brewery in Zacatecas, Mexico. Uh, trying to demonstrate that the profitability can be increased with uh, more production with less water, with more surface with the same available water, and they need, at the, at the end, less investment. Uh, what we made is uh, we tried to influence the public and private sector, and, uh, and we, we, we would like to scale it, because the first scope of this pilot was uh, covering 72 growers and 1,200 hectares, uh, and, what, uh, and the financing scheme here was uh, the government is uh, making or made a last fund of 45% of the cost to cover these 1,200 hectares. The farmer has, is being financed by the, uh, by the bank in a three years period. There are growers not only for barley, that is our main raw material. There are chile, there are alfalfa, there are oats bar, uh, farmers, and we are convincing them to, to rotate, and uh, maybe w one year alfalfa and the other year uh, uh, barley. And, uh, and the benefit for them is that uh, we are having contracts with them. They know the price since the really beginning, and they, are, uh, they can really sure, be sure that they, we are going to buy their crop. Uh, and of course, if you only give money to the farmers, they don't value it. So that's why we are putting the, uh, a rule that the farmer has to put 10% of the cost in cash. And uh, to make it possible, the company put a, a, a guarantee fund of uh, $120,000, just of non-compliance clause. But it's an example that it, ca it, ca it can be done. Uh, the challenge here is how, how we are going to scale it. Uh, for me, the success factors, uh, we need to work a lot with the government, the local and federal government, to, to work on policies and regulations. The, the water shouldn't be as cheap as it is now. Uh, try to define financial solutions. And, uh, and the main challenge in the zone is how we can help smallholders to be organized. Because the, the, the average in hectares for a farmer is less than three hectares per farmer. So it's a challenge to organize them and put these problems together. Uh, promote crop rotations, as I mentioned, and uh, start measuring the, the use of water and convincing them that uh, they, we need to work for the future and they can earn more money. And that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I was thinking there's supposed to be a pause between this group and I don't have a presentation, and our group. My role and that of my colleague friend is that of a discussant, which is a very pleasant role, is to sit there and criticize other people. <laughs> and at the same time, to say what I pick. Let me start before the criticisms by what have I picked from the presentations, starting with Tusha. I, I don't want to appear like um, redoing what he did, but I'll pick only two things per speaker. I liked, put top of my list, I liked the idea of solar energy to help farmers to pump 
and to have some excess for selling to the greed. And that's something I would really like to take home to my government because uh, it's a, our countries, a majority of them have so much solar energy and the greed is less than having enough energy. What a win-win solution. So that one I liked a lot. Then there was also your findings, findings of research a while ago that indeed um, motorized pumping has better returns on investment than manual. And you showed your figures nicely there. I can't agree more, I know that. It's talking to people who th think that uh, Africans still are supposed to, to, to like uh, use muscle power when the rest of the world has moved to the technology world and a fallacy like that is uh, more pro pro profitable, but your findings is what I know from my experience is the truth, that uh, motorized uh, pumping is going to give, make the farmer richer. Well, our, our disconnect actually is wo what is the source of that uh, mo motor? Is it diesel, is it uh, petrol, is it uh, grid, or is it solar? Uh, we have also information that um, both petrol and diesel uh, they don't really return investment very well, and maybe that's when you present another day when you, you show the differences between the two. Then I go to Dustin. I liked uh, your incentive-based water conservation, whereby um, you talked of how to give uh, incentives so that uh, water conservation is done. Uh, I'm telling you, I come from Kenya, I think so many types of, Kenya was mentioned many times, I think it's a nice testing ground <laughs> for so many types of uh, incentives. Let me say quite a number have failed. No one wanted to own up to the ones which have failed. If you want to find out those ones, you invite me, I'll, I'll give you a good example. And also, at the same time, quite a number have worked. I also liked uh, your water governance structure feel. May I mention that at Africa level, at my country level, we have something we call RUAS, Water Resources Users Associations. They are not an old thing in terms of like they came together with the GWP's 2000 to 2005 uh, push for IWRM, Integrated Water Resources Management. Those countries that were brave enough to embark on them, we are starting to see the fruits of IWRM at catchment level. Then there was Kate with 3.3 uh, million hectares irrigated in Nebraska. That maybe is Africa, <laughs> I think, all of it put together. So uh, we, you see how far we have to, to go to catch up. Uh, we have the potential, more than that potential, but we are moving very slowly. Then we find that uh, you said uh, there's a need for the portfolio, using a portfolio of approaches, not a one way. Uh, may I pose to say that I felt a one way throughout yesterday and today. One way, groundwater, groundwater, groundwater. Uh, back in Africa, my feel, my take, is we start with service water. When we can't get service water, we look at groundwater. You and me know groundwater should be a last resort because groundwater requires the farmer to fork out something from his pocket every day. Service water, if under gravity flow, is forever. Look at the uh, zero irrigation scheme done in the year 2019, 25. Still flowing, still serving farmers. Come what, come rain, come shine, it's there. So for, for us, I think uh, I, there's been a bit of shift for groundwater. Please give us space to also do something about uh, service, gravity, fed irrigation. Where it won't work, groundwater shallow. Where it won't work, groundwater deep. Where it won't work, something else will work. <laughs> then we have, um, uh, that was Kit, yeah. Then we have Ellen. What I liked most eh, is that uh, you talked of farmer to farmer trading, water trading. That one is something we should do. In sub-Saharan Africa, some countries are water rich, like DRC is very water rich. I consider our neighbors, Uganda, is very, wa are very water rich. Us Kenyans, uh, we are actually water scarce, and other countries. 
is a model we could look at uh, where visible, where it can be done. But uh, the easier one, the one I think, I think talking about uh, transboundary water sh uh, sharing or water seal is not in use. It has been, you know, these water forums uh, for the last 20 years, for I know. But the farmer to farmer water trading seems a, a low hanging fruit. Uh, something we could also look at and see how Africans could uh, do an African version of the same. Then Hossi, he told me it's not Joe's. So Hossi, uh, um, a very exciting presentation. I, I don't know whether this is the right forum. Uh, maybe an evening forum would have suited you better. <laughs> <laughs> Some of your products uh, to, to sample. Um, the PPP arrangement that you have. Sometimes PPPs are not also new, they have been around. In fact, even contract farming is around. The, it's a good model, it means well. The problem comes, there's some fellow who comes between you and the farmer, and then he or she messes it all up. And I tell you my country, we have had them, we grow barley too, we grow, we do irrigation, especially we do export horticulture. Uh, people will show you very nice figures of exports of flowers to, to Holland and how much money is made. Me, I've done. I've gone to the farmer level and I've traced that carnation, that rose, down to the farmer. The farmer is still as poor. So it's up to you, I think, because the farmer sometimes are at the mercy of those people. To, to, to see or this forum, to tell us what to do about a uh, hand-working farmer on one side, well-meaning contractor, be a brewer. Water is available for irrigation. Everyone doing their right thing. But a fellow from Nairobi will come there and take the money all away. So, so what do we do about that? It's it's a, a big, big problem. Now, uh, before I give to him, I have some general points. Uh, we today we were asked by the person who opened up this forum. Nicely put it, and it's true. The role of private sector has been very well articulated all throughout yesterday and today. What do you think is the role of the public sector? I would like to give you an example which is happening. It happened a few months ago in Kenya, and then it may illustrate why government is so important, why public sector. You won't move one step in Africa if government is not on your side, please. So let's first of all start by appreciating that we need our government working with you to move irrigation to the next level. This example I wanted to give is uh, suddenly a year ago, the government announced uh, they are going to ban plastic bags. And we were all saying how will life be? We, you know, we, some people have been born <laughs> with plastic bags, packaging food, everything. To cut a long story short, you know about it. Six months were given to clear, but in fact, instead of clearing plastic bags, people stocked up uh, in preparation for the ban. And then uh, even me had stocked up just so that, <laughs> but my stock has since ran out anyway. So, so the plastic ban came bang one day, I think from, uh, late last year. And to tell you the truth, today, walk through Nairobi, even in the slum areas, no one is carrying a plastic bag in public. So, so but the role of government is very important in enforcing what it is you wish to do. No NGO could enforce that. No foreign donor could enforce that. So government's role is important in providing policy, supporting the policies you draw from here, in enforcing the laws, in ensuring discipline, national discipline, and uh, discipline in water. When we say don't overstruct, we need someone and that person to enforce so that you don't over you share the water the right way. So the role of government is very important. Another one is government is also doing what we are trying to do here. I have been to, to Ghana. I found there a beautiful policy called uh, one, one, one dam, one village. You go to Ethiopia, they have one household, one water source. You come to my own country, the government has more than a thousand times increased the budget that goes to irrigation compared to 20 years ago. So governments are doing stuff. What is it they are doing that we can piggyback upon so that we are not doing parallel things that they are doing, we don't know what, who is doing what where. So governments, public sector, we begin with them. Then um, 
a, a quick one, irrigation in Asia, many thousands of years. Okay, even uh, Africa, we can claim there was irrigation during the time of Pharaoh uh, in Egypt. But in, uh, in a true sense, if we remove uh, sub-Saharan Africa, south of the Sahara, north of the Limpopo, where I come from, irrigation is something like the motor vehicle. It came the other day. Our people had enough land to roam around and doing shifting cultivation and whatever. A new irrigation is less than 100 years old as something we do in sub-Saharan Africa. We need to be taught. My um, parents don't know what a canal is, for instance, yet maybe they, they could benefit from one. So see us as people, as farmers who need to learn a bit like from scratch. Uh, we don't have that long history of irrigation. So we do an irrigation scheme, we relocate people from growing millet to growing rice. We, we, we have other software issues to be handled so that we bridge the cultural divide of irrigation unlike other rain-fed things like growing sweet potatoes and so on. Then, um, the, I think I mentioned this one, and electricity, uh, the forecast, and then the, well, the final one, so that I leave him something to say, is about the collab collective action, which is at the heart. Uh, somebody mentioned about collective action. It's Africans' natural nature to look after their brother or sister. It's African natural nature to do women, that's why we have so many women groups and whatever, working village banks and whatever. Those are models, again, you come, find uh, easy to start or find something happening, and you piggy back on that, and off we go. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I would like to uh, thank the World Bank Group as well as the Dori Global Institute for giving us the opportunity to be part of this. And uh, uh, it's been very exciting listening to a lot of the presentations this morning. Uh, since I joined yesterday, I've learned a lot uh, from this forum, and uh, I'm still learning as we go along. Uh, Trisha, I cannot agree with you more that um, actually there are a lot of contingencies uh, that um, spur collective action. And Africa is not unique. Uh, it's uh, actually a lot of these uh, applicable for Africa. And I also wanted to add that ac actually agrarian, um, the agrarian model is still applicable for Africa. Uh, and a uh, lot of uh, farm structures use diversity as a safety net. Uh, a safety net for economic shocks, a safety net for climate shock. So um, having said that, I wanted to uh, just uh, reiterate that yes, it's true, uh, collective action is also happening in Africa in, in different modes. And uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, an example is, um, for instance, uh, heterogeneity could actually help uh, or it could hinder collective action. And this depends on the context in which you're uh, referring to. Uh, an example is uh, Rwanda, for instance. There is a, an organization called Imbaraga, and Imbaraga, all it does is to actually lobby and advocate for farmers' profitability as well as productivity uh, using competitive mechanisms. So it's the farmer's voice. And if you wanted to get collective action in Rwanda in issues related to agriculture, water, that, so that is an entry point for you. And um, this has been actually seen as a, a vital instrument by the government as well, where they um, actually uh, spearhead a lot of other initiatives through these uh, groups. A very good example you gave is um, about um, the plastic bags. You know, Rwanda was uh, one of the first uh, countries on the continent to actually uh, ban uh, plastic bags. And in Baraga, what it does is to ensure that uh, also farmers adhere to these environmental um, restrictions because that impacts agriculture. If you have plastic bags within uh, agricultural fields, then you have an alteration of the flow regime and infiltration, you, you have less uh, delivery of water to the um, aquifers. The second example I wanted to point out to you is um, Senegal. There is a Société de Conserve, uh, 
Agriculture du Sénégal. It is called SOCUS. It is a, a private sector entity that is actually harnessing a lot of uh, uh, production and um, uh, industrial processing of tomatoes. And what it does, it has a huge collection of farmers, around 3,000 farmers, where it's uh, using them as uh, contract farming for actual collective action around this tomato value chain. The beauty about this is that it um, meets the farmers annually every year where they agree on prices, variety, as well as uh, other issues related to quality, and they sign an agreement. Now, this agreement is used as a purchase guarantee for the farmer, but also it's used as a collateral to obtain credit from other financial institutions. And then the farmers self-organize themselves into economic interest groups where they can actually have access to credit in order to prepare for the next season to get access to inputs. I really liked um, uh, the way this has transformed uh, the private sector inclusion in Senegal, and they also offer capacity building. I wanted to uh, just quickly add to what uh, Dustin had talked about in relation to rural urban linkages. This is also happening in Africa. I'll give you a very quick example where uh, we have worked through the Water, Land, and Ecosystems Program, which is a CGR program, uh, on looking at how we can foster protection of water from its source where water is coming from, and for it to be a benefit for people downstream, where you have Nairobi, uh, the capital that is a resident to eight million people, but what are you using? You're s using very simple technologies, like um, green infrastructure, where you have terraces, you have riparian grass strips, um, and, and forested landscapes to help uh, regulate the hydrology and flow of water, you have better reachage to the groundwater, but at the same time you have environmental flows that are, are contributing to the aquatic buildup and aquatic systems, then the city of Nairobi would have sufficient water to actually provide enough to those eight million residents. What that means is that uh, companies such as East Africa Breweries, I know Jose, you, you mentioned about the breweries, the breweries are reducing their costs of production because the water is cleaner, there's less sediment, there's more electric power generation. The last example I wanted to give in this is um, our work in Tanzania, which is through the Feed the Future initiative. Uh, we have um, collective action happening through uh, farmers, uh, mainly from village agriculture extension agents who use our boots as our boots on the ground. And what they do is that they're harnessing these farmers, but quickly beyond the agriculture that is helping these farmers, the farmers self-organize again to get access to credit. Now, Feed the Future Initiative helped us provide funds for looking at technologies that are outside agriculture that can actually help spur innovation. And yesterday, Professor Nuhu uh, talked about ICTs in agriculture. We have built a platform that is reaching out to 9,000 farmers. So that collective action is helping them know information related to agronomy, climate services, how can they uh, better organize in terms of uh, having access to markets? So this is uh, really very ongoing. I wanted to also touch a little bit on what uh, Ellen and Kate have uh, said, but uh, in the interest of time, allow me to stop at this. Thank you. I'd actually like to thank, I'd actually like to thank all of our panel for what they've done. But we have a very few moments left. I'd like to ask if there are any questions out here in the audience from any of you. So please, back there first. Can you please go to the mic? Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much to the speakers. I'd just like to make a, a point in support of African groundwater. I'm a hydrogeologist from South Africa, and uh, we're working on a report at the moment uh, for the World Bank, which sums up what we know about African groundwater so far. 
and in particular the figures that are available and uh, we're finding that we we're hardly touching our groundwater resource in sub-Saharan Africa we can have uh, increases of 10 or even 20 times uh, without damaging the environment and without uh, <coughs> running into unsustainable use we'll have our report out in two or three weeks time with a bit of luck but uh, uh, what we I if water is not the limit and and certainly for the kind of uh, small scale or Mickey Mouse irrigation that we've been talking about groundwater is going to be a major part of that uh, we're finding that it's it's really an absence of energy and uh, appropriate pumping technology and some of the other uh, input factors as well such as transport and extension and, and, and storage for agricultural products. So, uh, but if I could just uh, pass the message that, that we're slowly getting out, which is that uh, African groundwater, we, we have a lot of it, and there's a, there's a huge increase as a possible, completely sustainably and without uh, damaging the environment. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, Chair. Oui, bonjour. Yes, good morning. I would like to congratulate all the speakers for their presentations with their experiences. I think I have three questions. The first question, we didn't talk, uh, for those who are talking about it, uh, we talked about the interest of irrigation. You didn't talk about risks. And it is very significant durability, uh, Mr. Diallo said so yesterday. What we saw is that irrigation on a larger scale is an issue for salt in the land, salinization and competition, of course, for resources. These are issues that are political questions that we have to present. If not, we couldn't talk about the future. This is my first question. The second question is that each time that the private is uh, working with uh, small hoarders, we have small uh, surfaces. That's the first issue. And we couldn't imagine a world where all the uh, holders would have 100 hectares. So working for me with the private sector that needs a lot and small holders, we think that the issue is on volume. The private sector should say, this is what we need and not look at the surface that we have, that we can offer. And what you talked about uh, in, with Senegal, we have indeed two plants for tomatoes that work with us, and they tell us how many tons, we, tons they need per year, and that's what we give them. Some have half an hectare, others hectares, but since we're numerous, we have enough. That's where we should work. We shouldn't try and have everybody in the same space. That is the second issue. The third issue is the government. In our countries, we have 10 years for the investors from the government without taxes, without anything, in order to encourage investments. And those who invest 12, year, 12 months of a year with all the risk, they're not given anything. And we're talking about small holders. These are the issues that we have to present and pose. The first investor is the small holders. 85% of all production is financed by the small holders. We know that. We all know that. They, they pay inp inputs, equipment, and so on. But we say they're, they're small people. But one million small people, small people, it's a lot of money. Justice is what we need in the rules and regulation in order to promote investments. Big investments, you have everything, no. And small holders, no. And the last item, and I hope that our colleague from uh, South Africa will give us the information. What we were told is that groundwater aquifers, when we pump, they do not regenerate. That's what we were told. There is no recharge. Tell us what it is, what is what. And surface water is disappearing. So these were my questions. And our colleague from Asia, Pakistan, did show what is happening. Thank you. If you allow me to rephrase your statements into a little bit more of a question. What you've really done is you've identified 
um, the importance of collective management of these resources because they are public goods or public resources which belong to all, yet we do not all share the same amount of risk or the same amount of investment or have the same capacities. So when we're looking at these resources, I guess the question is, how can we make certain to address not only the individual risk, but that of the collective good of the society and for that matter, the environment, which is the other piece which wasn't mentioned. Uh, any responses from the panel be welcomed. Uh, thank, thank you. Let me ver very quickly uh, take a stab at that. The first one may be to be more context specific for Senegal. Actually, it is uh, very true that for regions, areas such as Saint Louis, uh, you find that excessive um, pumping of water is leading to salt water intrusion because it's really close to the ocean. So. Uh, necessary mitigation measures have to be made in order to pump responsibly. And this is critical not only for Senegal, but other areas in Africa where you have um, a lot of pumping taking place. It is true that uh, there are sufficient water resources in Africa, uh, but there's a lot of heterogeneity and variability that needs to be taken into context. For instance, three years ago, the British Geological Society uh, released um, a study about groundwater in the Sahel, and it showed it's renewable, and you could actually have even the next 50 years without necessarily exhausting that, provided you use about 30% of it. So it is renewable, but we need to take a lot of caution in, in doing that. Uh, I just wanted to pass it on to you. Um, I'll speak to a couple of those points. So you made the excellent point about risk. So sometimes we forget that a farmer is a businessman. They're taking the risk for investing um, without necessarily knowing whether or not that will pay off for them. So in Nebraska, right, we have a pretty good financing system for people to invest in irrigation technology, but we're looking at new technology, soil moisture sensors. There's a lot of money and that's a big risk for the farmer to take to buy these sensors without knowing whether or not it will pay off. So some of our districts have been doing cost sharing to remove some of that risk. Um, some of the more progressive farmers, indeed some of the districts, have been doing demonstration farms. They accept that risk. The government shows the technology so the farmer can go and see it in action. They have a better idea about what that technology will do for them before they make that investment. And lastly, with regard to groundwater, I'll admit that I'm not as familiar with the hydrogeology of Africa. Nebraska's in instance, I can give some clarity, the southern part of the aquifer has clay soils, very low recharge. Up in Nebraska, we are blessed. We have sandy soils with high recharge, and yet our pumping systems are such that we can over pump uh, more than recharge. So that's what we're trying to balance, uh, avoiding over pumping faster than recharge can occur. So I, I hope that provides a bit of clarity from our perspective. Well, I believe we're out of time. But I would like to thank all of you for having been here, and I'd especially like to ask you to help thank our panel. I think they've done a wonderful job in framing some of the issues. Thank you, Chris Hartley, Deputy Director and Senior Environmental Markets Analyst at the Office of Environmental Markets, USDA. That is some business card. Thank you for your moderation. Just out of curiosity, how many more questions were there? Put your hand up. It's going to be a fascinating coffee break. Here's your panel. Here are the questions. Get together. Thank you, panel. I will see you back here at 11 a.m.